Welcome to this IUN Community Garden session, Early Spring Wildflowers, the Jewels of the Woodlands. Our presenter today is Victoria Jostis. A little bit about Victoria. In her capacity as a master gardener, Victoria has revealed her passion for the natural world in self-authored presentations to civic groups, gardening clubs, and schools across Northwest Indiana. Being a master naturalist and amateur photographer rounds out her ability to bring nature indoors to adults and children alike, stirring imaginations as well as awareness. Welcome, Victoria. We're very glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Amanda. It's great to be here. Hello, everyone. I am Victoria, and I have been thinking a lot lately about the recent unseasonal spring-like weather that we've been having. And my conclusion is that a discussion on early spring wildflowers is just what the doctor ordered. Today, everything is beginning to pop. So we'll jump right into it. Let's take a look, first of all, at this beautiful watercolor rendering of a plant called trout lily. I'm thinking that Perhaps a fisherman named this plant, thinking that the leaves resemble his favorite catch. They're oblong, thin, narrow, spotted, um, whereas the flowers are a whole other story. They're delicate, little, nodding, lily-like flowers and very beautiful. They seem to not, not ever be seen alone. They're seen in colonies. The colonies can get quite large. They've been dated at more than 300 years old. I'm impressed by a tree that's hundreds of years old, but an old plant as old as that, it just knocks my socks off. And I keep wondering just how this plant can accumulate so many plants in a colony. I think it has to do with their reproduction. When this plant, this flower is pollinated, it begins to think about setting seed. So this plant can reproduce using seeds, but it has another way. The leaf is speckled and oblong above ground and unusual. Below ground, instead of seeing fibrous roots, we see a solid structure called a corm. That corm can fire off a bud. The bud then grows. It becomes a new corm and detaches from the original. And we have now two plants. But wait, there's more. They can reproduce in a third way by a very unique structure called a dropper. It starts out with a tiny horizontal outcropping from the corm and then grows a fleshy structure called a dropper and it drops down at the growth point. It forms a new corm, then it grows upward, breaks ground and forms all the above ground parts. At that point, it detaches from the corm and we have yet another new plant. Think about this. If the original plant produces just three new plants, one by seed, one by bud, one by dropper, and then each of those three new plants produces three more, and the next plants make three more, you get the idea. Pretty soon we have a humongous colony. Uh, and by the way, this plant is Myrmecocorus. More about that later. So what really is an ephemeral? Some plants have different ways than other plants and they have different names but they all have a biologic purpose. Their biologic purpose is to germinate or awaken from their hibernation. They mature, they set seed, and they spread their genetic material. 
Some plants can do that in a single season and then they die. We call those annuals. Other plants can accomplish all of that in a single season, but they don't die. They come back year after year after year and do that same accomplishment during the summer months and go dormant, but come back. We call them perennials. And there is a subtype, if you will, of these perennial plants. It's quite special. The difference is in the reproduction. This very unusual plant is called an ephemeral. It means transitory or short-lived. That's because instead of completing its reproductive cycle in a period of several months, or even one month, or even a couple of weeks, that's what it does. In days, it completes its cycle. And then the upper parts of the plant die back. The roots remain to gather strength from the rich soil, go dormant only to come back the following spring and do it all again using that very brief, very short reproductive cycle. And how do you suppose these plants can accomplish such a thing? I think it has to do with what they eat. It's their diet. We call these plants ephemerals, the jewels of the woodlands. They grow in the woods. We call it a wooded area because of all the woody plants that grow there, the trees, the bushes. Imagine that we're in the woods in the autumn. The trees are pretty colors and the leaves begin to fall. They fall to the forest floor along with twigs or a branch or maybe even an entire tree is uprooted and falls to the forest floor. We also find plants that once were living or animals that once were living. Animal waste, all of this falls to the forest floor. Can you imagine what would happen if that material, that woodland waste never went away? We would be up to our eyeballs in woodland waste, but nature's got a handle on this. She's got a trash squad and that consists of worms, many kinds of insects, microorganisms that include the fungus and the bacterium, and a couple of kinds of small plants like mosses and ferns. The next time you're out in the woods, check out fallen logs and see what's growing there. And what's the job of this trash squad? Their job is very simple. They help woodland waste to decompose. It's reduced to its basic components, the NPK, the trace elements, and what happens to those components? The spring rains and summer rains and winter snow melt all wash those components into the soil, making it a very, very rich growth medium. And that's just what ephemerals need to take them through this abbreviated season that they have. But wait, there's a fly in the ointment. In the woods, the trees have leaves forming a canopy at the top that blocks out much of the sun's light. These are ephemerals who need to photosynthesize. They've got chlorophyll, they need to do that. They've got it under control. They've figured out that if they emerge in the early spring before the trees leaf out, they can use CO2 and the energy of the sun to photosynthesize and create carbohydrates for themselves. So between that and this super rich soil on the forest floor, 
they can accomplish their minimalized growth season. But there's a few minuses now in this in this uh, in this whole situation. Many of these plants, the flowers thereof, tend to fall as soon as the plant is pollinated, especially plants like bloodroot. They're pretty anxious to lose their leaves. They are also sensitive to strong winds. The petals get beaten up, they get bruised. Some of the petals fall in deep winds. So when you're out in the woods searching for ephemerals, make sure that you go on a sunny day. A plant um, that is light sensitive will probably close the petals at night. And in the morning when they wake up and it's a cloudy day, they don't even get out of bed, they go right back to sleep. So you wanna go on a sunny day and you wanna choose a day that doesn't have a whole lot of wind. Uh, it's hard in springtime because springs are windy. That's why as kids, we flew kites in the spring. Um, but do your best to find a day that is not blowing a 30 mile an hour gale. And where will you go to find these beautiful flowers? One of my favorite spots is Gabus Arboretum, formerly known as Tall Tree. Um, you want to get yourself to the pavilion. And beyond the pavilion, you'll find Owl Trail. That's a wonderful place to start. You'll find the most in there. The native plant garden is another place to go. Um, uh, another spot that I enjoy is Deep River County Park, not Deep River Water Park, Deep River County Park off 73rd Avenue. You'll park in the lot all the way to the back of the lot near the bridge that crosses the river. You're not going to go over the bridge. You're going to go behind the bridge where there is a trail. And I would say that the first thing you're going to see on that trail in the way of ephemerals is one of these. This is called Prairie Trillium by its common name. Its botanic name is Trillium recurvatum. You can see the curve of the Trillium leaf right there. This is another type of Trillium. This is common name toad shade, funny name that has um, this, a similar look to prairie trillium. The leaves are a little more oval rather than oblong. Um, and there are two differences here if you want to tell the difference. The botanic name is trillium sessel. Sessel means without stems. There are no stems on these leaves, no stem on the flower. They grow directly from the top of the main stem. Whereas Trillium recurvatum, prairie trillium, you can see it right here. Two leaves have two stems. And the other way that you can tell the difference besides one has stems and the other doesn't is by the sepals. Sepals are these leaf-like structures that protect the flower bud before it opens. When the flower bud is ready to open, the sepals fall away and they rest on top of the leaves. Look at this inset. The sepals on Trillium recurvatum are pointing down. We find them under the petals. Now, toad shade in our region, up here in Northwest Indiana, are rather rare. They're more common the farther south you go in the state, but they're considered rare in this area. So if you're out and about and you spot a trillium whose sepals rest on top of the, of the leaves and they have no stems, wow, that really is a, a toad shade. And I want you to call me because I've never seen one in real life. This is an overhead view of a trillium. The first three letters of trillium refer to the number three. 
So let's look at this overhead photo. These are the petals, one, two, three. We see the leaves, one, two, three. And we see the sepals. There are three of those. I'm disappointed. Look at all those anthers. There couldn't possibly just be three there. There aren't because there are six divisible by three. All trillium have these traits. This is a superb example of a very early ephemeral. And it's early for a reason. Here is one of the pollinators. This happens to be a queen bumblebee. And she happens to be the favorite pollinator of Dutchman's britches. She comes out early in the season all by herself. That's because the rest of her colony has died in the winter. She's the sole survivor. She slept through the winter. And here she is, awakening from her slumber, flying low through the woodlands, looking for her favorite plant. And sure enough, there it is. She sees it. And what we see are these cute little flowers that look like the pantaloons of a Dutchman, and they're hanging on the clothesline upside down. I think it this flower looks more like Mr. Happy Tooth. And if you know who Mr. Happy Tooth is, you're as old as I am. This is really a petal, two petals that have been fused together to form the legs on the britches. And here at the waistband are some other structures that actually serve as, oh, guards, shall we say, to the inner workings of that flower where the business parts are. There's pollen right inside. And down at the end of each of these containers, shall we say, of nectar, we call them nectar spurs. And there's a structure within that um, spur that produces the nectar um, that is available to whoever, whatever insect can, uh, it can access it. And who can access it? Only these big bumblebees, because they're strong. And not only are they strong, they have a humongously long proboscis and an even longer tongue. So here is a bumblebee, and it's actually opening the flower that is hinged. It will open and close, and only a strong pollinator can open it up. Once it's open, the bumblebee pokes its head inside and reaches on down, extends its long proboscis and tongue and partakes of the nectar deep in the nectar spur. While the bee is doing that, it gets dusted with pollen. That flower being exhausted of the goodies for the bee, she moves on to another flower and goes through this same process. She's carried with her pollen from the previous blossom and she deposited, deposits it in the new one that she's at. She spreads the flower, pokes her head in and does her extraction of nectar and getting dusted with pollen. Do other bees visit this plant? This plant? Yes, they do. But they're missing some important things. They're missing the strength of this big bumblebee. They're not as strong as she is. They cannot open that flower, nor do they have the extended proboscis and tongue that she has, but they're still hungry. So what do they do? They fly over to the nectar spur and they punch a hole in the nectar spur and steal the nectar. They cannot open the flower to get to the business end of things. They can't access the pollen. So they do not pollinate that flower. Only the bumblebee can do that. Now, you can tell why the flower so values the bumblebee. She is their sole pollinator. 
And the bumblebee values the flower because it blooms early and furnishes her with nectar to give her strength to rebuild that entire colony single-handedly. She needs the strength that she's given from Dutchman's britches. She's gonna start laying eggs in her nest once she finds a place to build that nest. And she's not averse to using someone else's nest, um, a little mouse burrow. Um, she can use um, a fence post hole. If she finds that pen fence post hole, she immediately manufactures a couple of wax cups. They're nothing at all like honeybee comb. They're not as sophisticated and ordered as those. They're just for the bumblebee's use inside that small nest. And I say small nest as though she didn't have a big task. The bumblebee nest can, at its tops, can house maybe 40 to 400 bees. And yeah, that's 400 bees are a lot of eggs to lay to establish that, that new colony. But when you compare it to a honeybee's hive, those hives can contain 50 to 60,000 bees. That's one busy mama queen. If you're out and you have spotted Dutchman's britches and you're admiring how beautiful they are, their fern-like foliage, those stalks of gorgeous, delicate flowers, and the bee that comes to nectar on them, Resist the urge to take that bee and follow it and try to find where its nest is. Major mistake. Those bumblebees are protective of their nests. They will warn you off. They will sting you if they need to. If you don't move fast enough, they will sting you. And they're not like a honeybee. A honeybee is a docile bee. She doesn't want to, to sting you. If you provoke her to the point where she must sting you, she knows that the stinger is going to stay in your skin and attached to that skin is a piece of the bee. She loses her keister, she falls to the ground and she dies. She does not want to sting you. But don't be so bold as to um, get too close to the nest of a bumblebee. She will chase you. They have been known to chase people down. What we're looking at is the seed of a Dutchman's britches. Notice these appendages that are frosty white coming from the seed. We call those eliosomes. They're super nutritious. They're a little sweet, they're a little oily, and what self-respecting ant wouldn't adore eating something so luscious? But the ant knows better. As nutritious as they are, she wants to feed them to her babies. So she takes that seed and drags it off into her nest and allows her babies to feed on these eliosomes. When the eliosomes are gone, the ants have no further use of the seed, so they drag it off to their trash pile, aka compost, where the seed can germinate in a protected atmosphere. Now, some ants don't toss the seed in their trash. They take it back outside, outside their nest, where the seed is tossed into the soil, and it will germinate anyway. The process that identifies this procedure of ants dispersing seeds for a plant is called, are you ready? Myrmecochory. If there are eliosomes on a plant's seed, that plant is said to be myrmecochorous. Maybe you've been paying attention to these little M's that sometimes magically appear on my slides. That stands for myrmecochory going on within that plant. That plant uses ants to help them to spread their genetic material. 
I must confess, this is my favorite ephemeral flower. It comes in three colors, but the blue purple, purpley blue, that's my favorite color. Some are lighter in color are, and they actually look more blue than lavender and some are just a bit darker. This one's a bit darker. And the reason I like it is the color is one thing, it's stunning. But then you look in the center of the flower and the reproductive parts are different. Instead of being long, clubby looking anthers, they're tiny, petite little things. They're little puffs, little globular puffs. And when you look straight down at this, at this flower, as it is in real life, it looks like a tiny 4th of July explosion right in the middle of that flower. It's gorgeous. Um, I'm not sure who named this plant, um, Hepatica. I don't know if it was Linnaeus or who named it, but that person said that this three-lobed leaf resembles a human liver. I can't swear to that. Um, it's also said that the leaf is evergreen. I don't know about that either. When I have seen these leaves that don't die back like the other parts of the plant, when their cycle of reproducing is over, these end up on the forest floor. So when you're out in the winter and there's no snow on the ground and you see this strange looking three lobed leaf that's brown and purple, know that the following spring in that general area, you will see this, these beautiful hepatica flowers coming up to do their thing. We have a conundrum here. We've got flowers that look alike and we need to know how to identify them. When I'm out looking at ephemerals or any wild flower, I have this with me. I'm holding it in the front of my face so you can see what it is. It's a real thin, small book. It fits in my back pocket. The name of it is simply Wildflowers. And it's a Roger Tory Peterson book, the same guy that does the very informative bird book. Um, what I like about this, I don't know if you can see it. This is divided up according to color. If you don't know what a plant is called, you can't very well look it up, but you know what color it is. And the drawings help you to see the important parts of the plant. Um, a photograph sometimes can be really hard to show you things that you really need to notice to identify a plant, whereas a drawing can home in on those things. There's a brief blurb on each, each plant and when I want to know more, I keep in my car my big Audubon wildflower book for the eastern region of the U.S. And that, of course, will have the botanic name if I need to know it. So if we're going to look at these flowers and try to identify what they are and the flowers look alike, the flowers are not really helping us to make a distinction. So we have to look at the leaves. The leaves on this one are lobed and deeply cleft. There are three compound leaves, more than one leaf on a stem, compound leaf. This plant, the leaves are not deeply cleft, they're not low, they're barely even scalloped, but there are three compound leaves. Now this one, look here, it has five leaves. So we can look up in our book, a white flower that looks like this and has five leaves in the drawing. And we looked it up and we found that it's called a wood anemone. And here's the botanic name, anemone quinquefolia. These names come from the Latin. One, uno. No, it's unus. Unus in Latin. Duo, trace, quator, quinque. Five in Latin. Quinquefolia. So there's, there's a motive to the madness here. And on the same page, I see rue anemone, identifying this one with the smaller leaves, and false rue anemone, identifying this one. So it's not really hepatica. It's not a wild strawberry. It is false rue anemone. 
and yet another rule. One of my master gardener buddies gave me some plants that she said were dioecious. And I said, oh, that sounds terrible. You know, will they die soon? Are they sick? And she said, no, that means that a plant, rather than having flowers with both male and female parts on them, have flowers with a single gender. One plant has all male flowers, another plant has all female flowers. They don't occur together unless you plant them that way. And who pollinates them? Nobody, the wind pollinates these plants. The Lictrum dioecum is early meadow rue. The female plants are kind of, the female flowers are kind of funky looking, but I like them. They're unusual and different. Now you talk about different, these are the male flowers. And the, the anthers remind me of a Victorian lampshade with that fringe hanging from the bottom. Or you could say it looks like one of those cute little bitty show dogs that are very close to the ground and they've got all that long fur that wipes up the floor as they leave. Um, and you might think that this is the actual size of this flower. No. If you were to grow it in your garden, I know you would be out there every day in the spring crawling around on the ground looking for the buds to know if they're ready to open and to see when they do open and to admire them once they have opened. And that would be because the flowers are no taller than three eighths of an inch. They're tiny little boogers and they are just so beautiful. The leaves are small and delicate um, they don't spread in the yard. They're not obnoxiously intrusive. Uh, if they get to be a size that's a little big for you, you dig a few of the plants and share them with your buddies. Uh, this photo was taken off my back porch and you see here my gift from the ants. Myrmecochery at work. We call that in its botanic name, Dicentra curcularia. Dicentra being... Um, an, another another flower within that family is called bleeding heart, and it's a, an old-fashioned plant, but it's still grown today. We have here sanguinaria canadensis, sanguinaria coming from the Latin meaning blood. This is blood root. Here we have Virginia bluebells. The buds are true and rich pink. When those pink buds open, the flower is blue. Now, in my garden, I have no idea why, maybe it's my nasty uh, clay soil that the plant hates, but it didn't spread, spread its uh, genetic material too far. I started out with one plant, I bought just one, and then it made another one. So total plants there were two. Now, the bloodroot is a horse of another color. Some plants are satisfied just to spread their genetic material in a calm and peaceful way. But Bloodroot um, is an artist when it comes to spreading her genetic material. Her goal in life is to form a colony. So be aware that if you choose to grow Bloodroot in your garden, you will end up having many Bloodroots and you will share a lot of them. This photo was taken on a cloudy day. And we know that. <laughs> in two ways, that it's rather a dark photo, but it also shows that these blood roots only open partially on a cloudy day. Uh, the, the reason I like to take photos on, uh, on a cloudy day is the clarity of it. The clarity is, is unmatched, uh, if I can just figure out how to lighten them up. This is what the flower looks like when it's fully open. It's quite beautiful. Um, and a lookalike to some others that we have seen. It can be pollinated by bumblebees, by honeybees, by carpenter bees, even by this little andrenid bee, the one that we're told is solitary. But when they all get underground and dig their, their tunnels because they're ground dwellers, they get all these bees with all the tunnels and once they get them all done, they connect them all and have a party. I don't know how they can be considered solitary.
Now, there's an M on this slide, and that refers to the Dutchman's breeches and also of the blood root. Now, this is a very unusual plant. And when I first saw it, I was to totally puzzled. I had no idea what it was. The leaves, if you look closely at them, each one is a mirror image of the other. And I thought they were two separate leaves. Another cloudy day photo, folks. Another cloudy day where all the petals are pretty much closed. This is what they look like when they're open. And we see those long clubby anthers in, on the inside. That's a clue when you want to identify. There's also another structure. This is when it's, when it's not ripe. It's the same color as the leaves and it's hard to even see them. They look like mini apothecary jars with a little knob on the handle. And then as the seeds inside that capsule ripen, so does the container. It turns a more yellow color. And as soon as the seeds are super ripe, it's like a timer on your microwave. It goes off um, and this one, the timer goes off and the lid pops open to make visible the seeds and they can be dispersed either naturally or by our friends, the ants. The common name for this plant is twin leaf. These are not two leaves. When you see them, when they're small, the twin leaves are folded like a butterfly's wings at rest. And then they eventually open they're conjoined in the middle. They are, are they are actually one single leaf divided into two parts, and they truly are images of each other. The botanic name is Jeffersonia diphylla, Jeffersonia with two leaves. Benjamin Barton, the father of American botany, is said to have named this plant for Thomas Jefferson, a friend. There's another botanist of that era, William Bartram. He has been also credited for naming this plant Jeffersonia. Um, we'll never know. On, uh, on this occasion, I'm going to uh, take the liberty of making a brief side trip. We're gonna go to Monticello here is Jefferson's home that he designed. It's pretty amazing. Aside from being uh, a secretary of state of his new country and the third president, he's also an, ar an architect and he's also a crack gardenist. He's a botanist in his own right. Look at the orderly fashion that he grew his garden in. It makes me think that his thought processes were orderly. Otherwise, he couldn't have accomplished all the many things that he did accomplish. We've all heard of the Lewis and Clark expedition, where they traveled across the western half of the U.S. and explored the area that they traveled in. What you didn't know is that they studied botany for two years before they left. They studied, perhaps under Barton or Bartram, maybe both of them. Why would they study botany before they went on their expedition? Part of the purpose of the expedition was to investigate plant life west of the Mississippi to see how different it was from what they were used to in the East. So they embarked on their journey and they did find plenty of plants that were so different from what they were used to seeing. They carefully dug them, carefully wrapped them and protected them because the goal was to send these plants back to Jefferson so that he could plant them, grow them and study them in his garden. The sad part is it took several years for those plants to reach him. Miraculously, many of them survived. He was able to actually grow them, to revive them, and to study them. 
we have here a pair and a spare. The pair are two spring beauty plants. We all love to see them growing in someone's yard to the point where their whole lawn looks pink. They grow in savannas, they grow in wetlands, they grow on ravines. They're very versatile little plants, tiny little things that they are. The stems can grow one or five or six flowers. Even the buds are beautiful on spring beauty. They're such a different plant from this plant. This is wild ginger. It is not the culinary ginger that we cook with. It's wild ginger. I've used this in my gardens as a ground cover and it works beautifully. The leaves are so lovely. They're very healthy looking and green. This plant has a secret. It has flowers. You can't see them from here, but I promise you that before we wrap it up today, I will show you the flower of a wild geranium. These flowers to us can look white or pale pink with deep pink veining. That's how we see them using visible light. If I were a pollinator and I approached this plant, I would see petals that were glistening white and very true green, a true pink, a deep pink veining on the flowers. Look where they're pointing. The center that we see is green. The center that I see as a pollinator is going to be deep, deep pink. Do you see what mother nature has done for the pollinators? She has directed them to the business end of the plant so that plant can be pollinated and spread its genetic material. Invisible light, I'm not saying invisible light, I'm saying in visible light. This is how we see this yellow aster. This is how a pollinator sees it. How can that be? These white portions of the petals contain reflective UV pigment. The center of the flower contains absorptive UV pigment. So color is reflected here but absorbed here, creating a bullseye effect for the pollinator. The same holds true with this yellow primrose. Yellow as we see it, this is how a pollinator will see it. The runways that lead that pollinator to this deep, deep, deepest pink center where it can get nectar and pollen so that the plant can spread its genetic material. I included these photos just because they're so beautiful. This happens to be a spotted bee balm. It's a native. Um, the others, I have no idea what they are. I just know that they're beautiful. And the middle one is illustrative of the fact that not all centers of flowers appear as pink shades to a pollinator. Just shown as a different color from the rest of the plant. This is probably not a leafy, leafy structure. I would say those are sepals just by the shapes of them. But again, I included them just because of the beauty of that ultraviolet light. I took this photo in my secret spot. That's not so much a secret anymore. I've let my, my, uh, my Photo buddies know where it is. We've gone there on little expeditions and some of my friends wanted to know where I take uh, my pictures. Um, this beautiful flower is called Spring Cress. Oh, if you're wondering where that secret spot is, it's in the floodplain of Deep River. Spring Cress is just a very attractive flowering plant. It grows in that secret place of mine in very boggy conditions in spring. I wear my wellies to keep my feet dry um, because the ground actually squishes when you walk there. And I have to tell you a secret about my secret place. A couple of years ago when I went down the ravine to where it is, 
I actually found tumorel mushrooms. I didn't pick them. I let, let them grow and maybe they'll form a colony and uh, I'll go back someday and, and find my supper. Uh, be that as it may, here is another plant in the same mustard family. It's got many more leaves. It's got compound leaves. This is a single leaf. These leaves are very similar in shape, basic shape. They have scallops and points like this one. This has scallops, blunt points. <laughs> is that a, an oxymoron? Um, this plant you will find at Gabus Arboretum at the beginning of Owl Trail. There's a big oak tree right there. And at the base of the oak tree, you'll see the green foliage come up first. And at a short time after that, you will see the flowers that much resemble spring crest. The difference is they are upright flowers, whereas spring crest is nodding. By the way, this plant has a common name that's similar to dentaria, its botanic name. It's called toothwort. And uh, early settlers, when they saw these plants, they had no idea what they were looking at. They knew what they brought with them from their homeland, but they didn't know what they were seeing here. So sometimes they would name a plant after how it looked um, or how the root looked. Um, who knows why they named this one toothwort. Maybe someone used it for a toothache. We have no idea, but it's a very interesting name. Uh, this photo also was taken off my back porch. It is my colony of 30 year old Jack in the pulpit. This thing gets almost three feet high in the summer and it's about three feet across. It's a bunch of plants all together. What a colony. If you look at this photo of a Jack in the pulpit, it's noticeably a different color. It's not that this one or this one is getting more or less of any nutrient or sunlight or whatever. They're two different species. That one is green and this one is maroon striped. They have three leaves. It's, it's more um, visible on this drawing than it is on the photo. It's hard to see because I've cut the tops off. Um, when the plant comes up, it has a sh it's covered by a sheath. This one is green. This one, um, I'm having a hard time seeing it because of how the side panel is, but it's, it's mottled, speckled with maroon. And that splits open and the stem grows out of it with leaves on top. Another stem will grow with the flower. This is a cutaway of what the flower looks like inside. Um, this background drawing shows the leaf that is a, uh, it's a modified leaf. It's called a spathe and it shelters Jack in his pulpit. This is what Jack really looks like in the cutaway. Here comes a fly. A fly dives down into the plant. It senses that its dinner is in there. So it crawls down, 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 down. It's not encountering dinner. It turns around and wants to leave. It can't get out. Then it panics and it starts to crawl around and fly around in a frenzy. It's getting pollen all over it. And finally, its hysteria is rewarded. It finds the trap door and out it goes to the next flower to do it all over again, carrying with it some of that po pollen that it accumulated during its frenzy. It is now pollinating the next flower. Once the pollination is done, All that's left when the plant dies back, stems, leaves, and all, is a cluster of fruit. They start out green, and then they turn red. The covering over them develops into a fleshy, protective covering. If you should decide that you want to grow more Jack in the Pulpit, from seeds in your garden. You can do what I did, take a clipper and clip it off at the stem that is for all intents and purposes, it's dead. It's just keeping 
the bunch of seeds out of the soil for a reason, think about it. So I cut it away from its stem and I lay it down in a section of the garden where I want new plants to grow. A Couple months later, come back out there and the seeds are all separated. The coverings are gone. I don't know if a mousey does that. I have no idea, but the seeds are all separated and naked. I don't bury them. I don't do a thing with them. They manage by growing a root to worm their way down into the soil, and that's where they stay. And in the spring, they come up, new, new baby plants, and this is how they look. They're tiny baby plants. They're not like the established plants that have this protective sheath. They're just a new baby plant. But it takes a while for the baby plants to bloom. It, it can take uh, not just weeks. Um, it can take years four, five, six, seven years. And during the time before it's ready to actually do its thing and set seed, it changes genders. It goes back and forth. It can emerge as one gender, then change to another, and then change back and become a female so that it can reproduce. Very unusual plants, very, very. If you decide to grow them in pots, Get yourself a little sieve or strainer like this. Put rubber gloves on or nitro gloves because you're going to get in there and squish away the red coating, that protective coating on the seeds, and it contains calcium oxalate and it will bite you. Uh, it's a it's an irritate an irritant for your skin. So once you squished all of that covering off, you can either pick out the seeds and save them, or you can pick out the the red material and um, dispose of it. You don't want to let those seeds dry up. They're not tomato seeds where you dry them and then plant them. These, you wash them, get the covering off and plant them immediately. So have your little pots ready, put the seeds in, maybe just a quarter of an inch deep. And there you go. If you're fortunate enough to have them germinate for you, you can have multiple plants to share. This is the earliest of ephemerals. This is what uh, skunk cabbage looks like. It has a spathe and a spadix. Um, the earliest flies will pollinate it because they, um, they can detect the scent of their dinner of rotting meat. So they come and they get warm. They emerge early in the spring because they can generate heat to melt their way up through the snow and ice. These leaves get to be two or three feet high. They're 90% water. So when it comes time for them to disappear in June, they do that. They disappear, they, they lose their water and there's not much left, um, just a piece of uh, what looks like cheesecloth in tan. These plants are smart. They grew in a place right on this log where they can get NPK and trace elements on the hoof. And I will say two things about woodland flocks, just two things. They're quite beautiful. They're in my favorite color and they know where to get that boost of nutrition. Violets. I'm not gonna say much about violets, except that these are the ones that grow at the edge of the woods behind my house and I wait for them every year. What we don't know about violets is that they react to various plants the same way that monarch butterflies do. Their larvae are specialists. Monarchs will only eat uh, milkweed. Fritillary is a specialist on violets. So don't take all the violets out of your lawn, save some for the fritillaries. Without violets, we will have no fritillaries. And last of all, we have a mayapple. Everybody knows what mayapple is. We see it out in the woods. Um, the plants in the colony are mainly clones of the original plant. The seed that comes from the fruit, that comes from the fertilized flower falls to the ground 
and once the fruit decays, the seed is all out in the open and free to be in the ground to germinate, but it doesn't germinate. It must pass through the gut of a reptile before it will germinate, either uh, a snake, um, a turtle, very strange. This is a chart of approximate bloom times. The, the bloom times are always approximate, but this year it's going to be worse with this warm weather that we've had recently. In, as Even though it is an approximation, hang on to this. It gives you a chronology of how things bloom. These are resources. If you decide that you would like to grow some ephemerals, you may not go out into the woods and dig them. You may not, but some places sell them. You can't go into Home Depot and find Jack in the Pulpit. It doesn't happen that way. You can find it for one place at Wild One's annual plant sale on May the 4th between 9 and 3 in um, Lake Etta County Park. You can go to their website, Gibson Wild Ones, and see photos of what's on their plant list so you can know and decide ahead of time what you want to pick up at the sale. This is online sales at Prairie Moon. I love this site. Here's another uh, site, Prairie Nursery, um, online sales. Other sites here are purely informative. You can learn a lot from them, like Lady Bird Johnson Flower Center. If you have some money burning a hole in your pocket, you can go to Lady Slipper Orchids online sales and buy a very pricey Lady Slipper Orchid. I promised you the photo of wild ginger. This is it, only three petals, very strange, and it has a beard. I wanna point out Trillium grandiflorum. That's the biggest Trillium. You see them in huge colonies in the woodlands. It forms a monoculture. It's just a blanket of these flowers. If you spot some in your travels around uh, rural areas, notice what you're seeing there. Um, they, they grow rather tall, taller than the other trillium. Get them while you got them. Take pictures as long as they're there, because in a short time, the deer will have them. They are deer candy. And on that note, I wish you great success in your quest to find treasures on the forest floor. Okay, we are done. How about questions? Thanks so much, Victoria, for that presentation. We do have some questions, mostly about bloom times. Um, it might be helpful to go back to that bloom time slide, if you could. Uh, the specific questions were about the length of time um, that blood root will bloom. Blood root will bloom as long as it holds its petals. As I said, they're sensitive to the wind. The wind can dislodge petals. And as soon as the plant is fertilized, soon after that, it drops its petals. We're talking days here. So then it looks like it would start blooming in March, but then the individual plant would only bloom for potentially a few days. Probably. Mm -hmm. Is that the case for most of these on the list? Meaning? Uh, they will bloom at the start around the start time you have listed, but then only last for a few days. No, that blood root is, is a sensitive thing because of its, its uh, fragility. It's very fragile and uh, subject to wind damage. And then it's, uh, to, to make that even worse, as soon as it's pollinated, it starts to drop its petals. And then what, what you're left with is uh, the seed capsule, which is a small elliptically shaped capsule that is not cute. <laughs> It's not, it, it doesn't hold a candle to the actual flower. Okay, it looks like, so then uh, in contrast, Virginia bluebells, they have listed March through May. So some of those plants might last a bit longer then. Correct. Thank you so much, Victoria. This was a really fun and informative session. I appreciate you taking the time. No problem, glad to do it. I enjoyed being with you here.